Audience, so no problem, we're gonna be talking in English. And if you don't understand anything on the slides, please let me know, no problem, but just focus on me. So on the layer one, we had amazing applications. We got a lot of applications, very, very interesting. For example, AMMs that could let you transact with different tokens, but these were very, very, very expensive, right? We also had oracles that allow us to introduce that off chain into on chain. Right? But this was also very expensive. Moving data on chain is expensive. We also have gaming, where you can have NFTs, very cute NFTs. You can have your sword for your game, your gun, and so on. You can maybe move it to another game. But still, the game was, was led, was directed by a single entity that had the control over the game. So the game logistics, the game logic was not on chain, it was not auto regulated. Yes, because this is very expensive, right? Also, we have voting apps, but also, again, writing in storage, writing to the blockchain is very expensive. So voting was also really expensive on layer one. So this is very interesting application that we have in the layer one, but that introduces problems when we are talking out cost. So we know the state, the current state of things is either we have a huge machine that is processing everything. We know this, uh, for example, banks, uh, current APIs, uh, companies, startups, and so on. Very huge machines, they can process a lot of transactions very quickly. And now we're looking at the blue part where we are trying to create a decentralized system, which is when a lot of persons can verify the integrity of the system, right? This is what we're trying to do. The problem is that this is very slow and this is very expensive. And the computation repeats itself various times at different points. So it's not optimal for scalability. Of course, this was a choice when we decided to create Ethereum, we wanted the centralization, we wanted security. It was a choice to sacrifice at that moment scalability. But now we know better and we can do better stuff. So the question is, can we get, can we get decentralization, security, and also scaling? Yes, we can do it with zero knowledge rollups. And we are here today to talk about StarNet. So we're talking about a platform, a layer two, that is secure by Ethereum. It allows you to create smart contracts, general smart contracts. It's Turing complete. The cost of execution is much lower. And you can create amazing things that are not possible, even imaginable, in the layer one. So we can get much more for each piece of gas. So this is a quote from Nelly Ben Sasson, our founder, at Bangladesh in the 29th of July. He's talking about the objective of StarNet, which is creating a solution for scaling that is focused focus only on scaling Ethereum. And this is called Cairo. So at Star Wars, are experts on both the Ethereum virtual machine and also in creating stack systems. And there was a, a conscious choice not to use the EVM to scale. We created a new virtual machine called Cairo. This, is, this was a conscious choice because we believe this is the way to achieve the biggest scaling. And this scaling is going, to, is going to come from smart contracts written in Cairo. And in Cairo is a virtual machine, but also a language we have. So what is Cairo? Cairo is a truly complete language, a uh, programming language that allows you to create probable programs. In this case, in Spanish, programas demostrables. You can execute your Cairo program, and then you can prove uh, a smart contract on the layer one on Ethereum that this a transaction was correct. This allows us to have much more, much cheaper transactions cost. And because pro when the smart contract on the layer one pro validates that this proof is correct, it's much cheaper than running the transaction itself. So this allows us to create, mo to get much more scalable solutions uh, using the layer two in this case with, Ky with Cairo and Starnet. So this is our solution, the zero knowledge rollups, specifically talking about Cairo and StarNet. You can get extremely, extremely cheap computation thanks to Cairo. And we can create, and this is key, we can create interesting applications that are only be that could only be made using 
the layer two. It's impossible, practically impossible to do on the layer one. And this is some interesting data that we got during the last week. Starnet plus Star Trek plus Starnet. So Star Wars, the company, uh, has different solutions. One of them is Star Trek, and the other one is Starnet that we're talking about right now. And both together have more transactions since July than Bitcoin, Lightning, and other layer twos. This is something that is not very well known. But as you can see, coming from July, the blue line is the Star Trek plus Starnet. Down is Bitcoin in orange, and under that are other layer two solutions. So as you can see, Starkest and Starnet is currently being very, very used. And we have been live in Mainnet since June, yes, June 2020. So we are not new at this. We know how to do it. The Star Solutions is very good. And as you can see, it's very, very, it's been very used. And very interestingly also is that 70% of that comes from NFTs. It's very interesting. For example, with Immutable, with Sorare, interesting. So now, thank you very much for coming. Now we know that Stunt has a lot of potential. You can create an init whenever you want. You can deploy it currently. And actually today we'll be creating a voting application that we're gonna be trying on Starnet. Uh, you can use it, Cairo is a different language, we know it, but it's also a language that everybody can use. It's not hard at all. So my name is Omar Spejel, I'm a developer advocate at Star Wars, and thank you very much for coming today. The goal of today is for you to get the resources to, st to start studying Cairo, if you want, to go into StarNet, and also make a small example of a boring application. So now we talk a little bit about what is being done in layer one that is very costly and we can improve. What, now, Let's talk about what can we do with all this power that cheap computation can provide us. For example, we have a solution called CKEX. It's a company that is offering high frequency trading. This, of course, is impossible in the layer one. Imagine having micro positions and trading with them. I don't know, it would be impossible because of the cost in the layer one. Makes no sense. We talked before about voting. Voting is very expensive too. So there are also solutions, for example, Snapshot X that allow us to vote much more cheaply, yes? So there are a lot of applications that are being already developed inside Startup that are using all this power. Another one, for example, is the government of Buenos Aires created an application that allows you to have an identity on the blockchain as a, as a user, as a citizen. They, cho they chose Starnet because it's very secure, it's highly, highly secure, and also it's very scalable and very quick. So these are only some examples, but the ecosystem is growing by the day. For example, we have uh, tools, amazing tooling, for example, coming from Hardhat, OpenCepelim, um, Chainlink, uh, Soon, Alchemy, those are well-known companies. But we also, and maybe more interesting, we have different applications on the top, as you can see, that are being created originally on the layer two. So this is very interesting because it's, uh, and this is my opinion, it's not uh, for, for the company overall, but uh, it is interesting when a company comes from layer one and then puts its applications in layer two. It's great. They are using the, the, the lower uh, fees and that kind of stuff. However, I believe that the real power is being used by those that are created natively on Cairo in the layer two. Yes? It's a little bit like, for example, when you had Windows in your computer, Windows 98, for example, and you had uh, these nice and cute games, and then comes, for example, Windows XP. Right. It's more powerful, you can do much more stuff, and these games can be, mm, can be passed into XP, okay? So these old games can be passed into the new software, and they run well, it's okay. They maybe could leverage some of the power of the new operating system, but the real power comes from that that is being built on top of XP that could not be done in the previous operating system, right? That's what we're talking about here, something that is completely different and out of the league of the layer one. We can create something very, very interesting that is impossible to create. For example, we were talking about the games that they didn't have the logic on chain. This is now possible. So imagine that you can do operations, uh, summations, multiplications, divisions, whatever. You can do that because the gas is much, much cheaper. So a company, I don't remember, I know the, the name. What is the name of the project that was creating this on-chain reality? 
topology. So topology creates a, a game on-chain and it's auto-regulated, okay? So you don't need a central entity to decide if you are allowed to play it or not. So it, it will stay forever as long as Ethereum exists. This is something that is, again, impossible layer one. And for me, those, the power is, co is going to come from that part. So now the question is, uh, what can you create that is completely different from what has been created in the layer one using all these new power, all these new potential that you can find in the layer two that is so completely different, never done before. Imagine you can do, for example, machine learning on chain. You can train models on chain. You can create any kind of mathematical operations on chain. It's completely different. And what we need is people that start building these applications that are eye-opening. So uh, for the beginning, you will need to start installing Cairo, Starnet. I, of course, I don't expect, it, expect you to do it right now, but uh, you can follow these QR codes for some instructions on how to install Cairo and Starnet so you can get going. It's not difficult at all. And uh, while you scan it, we also have a report that is called Starnet EDU, where you can find a lot of educational material. I will show you the link with, uh, in a couple moments. And inside Starnet EDU, you can find a lot of tutorials on different stuff. For example, you can know how to, how the Cairo, how the Cairo syntax look. Nah, we're gonna look at it in a moment. You can, for example, uh, create a token, an ERC20. You can create your NFT. You are C721, tutorials, uh, for, but even more interesting, how you can create your own bridge from layer one and layer two, a trustless bridge. And for example, how can you create your own wallets? Yeah, so you can, if you can scan this QR code, you will find all that material inside and you can get uh, going by yourself without, without any problem. Those tutorials are amazing and they have onboarded a lot of people into the ecosystem. Also, we have a newsletter that is very nice and you will have a lot of educational material there too. And also some uh, interesting projects happening on the, on, the, on the ecosystem. It's also there, you can subscribe, it's a Substack newsletter. And finally, what we're gonna be doing today is a voting application that will allow a person to either vote for one or zero, one for yes, for example, zero for no, and deploy it on the test nets. If you have any question until now, you can tell me. This is the repo that we're gonna be using. So if you want to have the repo, you want to clone it, you want to copy the code or just look at it, feel free to scan these QR codes. Any questions, comments? Well, we start with the coding part. Oh, okay. I have a question actually. How many of you know how to code in Solidity? Can you raise your hand? Cool. How many of you have ever coded in Cairo? Oh, a few of you, cool. Okay. Coming from Solidity into Cairo is very simple. Yeah? Really, really simple. And it's great that you're already working with Solidity. Perfect. If you want to go to the testnet and see already and interact with, with this contract, feel free also to scan this QR code. It's the testnet already working with these voting contracts. I redeployed a couple minutes ago. So in this, in this table is the Star Wars team. We have some swag in here if you want to come also. And I don't know, guys, do you want to add something else before we start coding? Perfect. Okay. Do you need another QR code? Uh, do you have already the, the one with the contract where we were going to use? Is this one, remember please? So let's go to the codes. So this is our voting contract. Again, the goal is to create a contract that allow certain predefined addresses. For example, me as the admin of the, of the, of the boat, 
I can tell, okay, this address can vote, this other address can vote, this address can vote. Because we don't want everybody to be able to vote, only certain participants of, of a project, I don't know. And they will be able to vote yes or no, yes with one, no with zero, and yes, that will be all. So for this, let's review the structure and how Cairo looks. This, here we are importing our packages, very similar to how it looks in Python, as you can see it. Then we define structs, as you would, for example, in Rust. First, we create a boat counting structs, where you will be able to store the boats with yes or no. So for example, we'll have 10 boats with yes, zero boats with no, something like that, the counting of the boat. Secondly, we have voter info, where we store information about the voter. In this case, I only very simply allowed, I simply uh, added an allowed member that it will have a one if it's allowed to vote or zero if not. If, if this person has already voted, it will have a zero. Now coming to the storage. The storage variables uh, allow you, you know, if you know Solidity already, these are very similar to you. They allow you to map from one, uh, from one expression to the other. In this case, for example, the first one. Now let's go to the third one here. I am able to map an address to a, to, to a is register variable that in this case is a felt. So Cairo is type, it's a type language. Now you, you might ask yourself, what is a felt? Felt is what is beneath Cairo. Everything is a felt inside Cairo, converts into felt. And basically for our purpose right now, if you want, we can get a little bit deeper in a moment, both for now in order to to, get, to make the most of the time, a felt is like a big interior number, a huge interior number, okay? So uh, in this case, as you can see, the address has not an address type as in solidity. It's a felt, okay? So we're mapping an address that is a felt to a felt called is register that we have a one or zero or whatever. We haven't defined it yet. And on the other ones, we are mapping uh, other information and interestingly, in the first one, we are mapping nothing, yes, nothing, to a structure, the bout counting. So this allows us to read or write into the memory. That's as simple as that. I can read this, or I can write into the memory using these ones. So using the storage variable voting status, uh, if we read it, and if I, I will go right now to the deploy contract, so this is the deploy contract I'm using right now, Voyager, which is a block explorer for Starnet. If I go to the read part of the contract, I can see what voting status is doing. Uh, using a getter function that we will see in a moment, we can see the status of the voting. Right now, because nobody has voted yet, we have zero votes with yes, zero votes with no. So that is the storage. We are reading right now this storage variable with a getter function that we will get to that in a moment. And also we have the boring info and it's the same. I, I won't go into this, but basically we're storing information into the, uh, in the, into the storage of the, of, the, of the blockchain. Now let's go to the constructor. Looks very similar. You know, when you initialize your, your contract, when you deploy it, you have to define certain inputs as in Solidity, exactly the same name. So this constructor will ask for three different input variables. As you can see now, we can, we can view how the, a function looks into Cairo. It's very simple, very similar also to, to Python. And uh, what is important here is this part. These are the inputs, the explicit inputs to this function. In this case, the inputs for the constructor that we have to provide it when we deploy this contract. So I'm asking for an admin address, the person that's going to be uh, able to to manage this, this contract with a felt again. Then the number of addresses that will be able to vote. And finally, the, this is a pointer. So it's important to know that Cairo is a low level language. So here we can manage the, the memory. We have to manage it. So the register addresses is basically a vector with the different addresses that are able to vote. I can add five, six, seven, eight, whatever. 
And this pointer felt points to the start of that vector. But you won't even notice that. It's, uh, it, the logic behind it is that this is pointing to the start of this array of different addresses, but you won't, you won't notice that, as you, as you will see. Then we're basically using a contract, because we have OpenSampling on top also of, of StarNet, so we're able to use uh, very secure contracts, thanks to OpenSampling. And here we're using the ownable contract from OpenSampling. Before, I imported them here. So I imported the ownable a contract and the possible contract libraries from OpenSampling. Ownable basically uh, defines who the owner is of something, and possible, it allows you to pause a contract in case of an emergency. Say that, for example, my application is being hacked, so I can pause it. As simple as that. But also, we have ERC721 logics and ERC20, so you can use it with OpenSampling. That's very, very useful. Very, very useful. Any question until now? We have seen the constructor, we have seen the storage variables, structs, how to import. How are you finding Cairo? Too difficult? Or is it nice? Any questions? Yes. How do you... Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Yes, uh, for example, if you have, in this case, we will be using uh, addresses that are in an, exa an hexadecimal format, right? It will simply be converted to a field. Behind it will be, we will actually deploy right now our contract using hex hexadecimal values, and you won't have to convert it to a field. But you also could convert it to a field and also deploy with that. No problem. Right now we can think of it like big integers, and we can get deeper into that. Mm, any other question right now? We have seen constructors, storage variables, structs. Well, perfect, okay. So we have our constructor, and with this we can deploy our contract. Also this, uh, as you can see, the structure of the contract is very similar to Solidity. We're trying to follow the guidelines of smart contracts in Solidity. You have getters, you have the constructor, and uh, the, the format is very similar. Also, if you go to this contract, it's very well uh, commented, so you can know what is happening. Uh, so it doesn't have uh, inheritance because um, we gave the ownable contract function basically explicitly the admin address, which is, is not like... Okay, so the question is if we have inheritance in Cairo. Yes. I think uh, you guys can... Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> there's no inheritance in Cairo. You don't inherit your contract. What you do is you import your function. So if you're looking at the, bot the top of the, uh, of the contract up there, uh, here is importing uh, a template developed by OpenZeppelin. So he's importing the full contract, which is called Ornable. So it means that he imports all the functions that are inside of this contract. And inside of this contract, you know, he creates it creates a few variables that can be initialized, and um, one of them is called the initializer, which is supposed to be called during this constructor. Does that make sense? Yes, um, I was just curious because usually that's automatically initialized. So it's not explicitly, it's not automatically initialized because, um, because it's not, it, like the contract is not ownable. It imports some function and it has no way to know that this is the specific context of the constructor. So you need to initialize it explicitly. Uh, regarding the question on felt earlier, um, I'm not sure what confuses you, but when you're looking at variables in Solidity, you know, at the bottom of it, at the end of the day, it's a number. And Cairo is a fairly new language. It will get better in the next few months. But right now, it treats everything as a number. So if you want to perform actions when you need strings, you basically need to assume that you receive them as numbers, you convert them, you do your operations, and you do all this kind of stuff. Make sense? Sort of. Yep. Yeah, so uh, a felt is, a, as you mentioned earlier, I think I heard you say it, it's a field element. So Cairo is like the, a felt, you can think of it as a big int, but it's basically a, 
uh, number over a big film, the field that is a prime that does indeed uh, um, field integer uh, mathematics and arithmetics. That makes sense. So it's really like you can treat it as modulo operations. The only time where it gets weird is for uh, divisions. Division sucks. I don't like them. <laughs> well, they're handable, eh? no problem with that. So, for example, we were talking about the ownable contract. This is the one that we're importing. So, we have it here locally and we're importing from it. This is the ownable, which comes in a namespace. So, we're importing these functions. Yes. Nah, no problem. There's, there are no inheritance in Cairo. Perfect. So going back to our contract, let's go to. So uh, we import these functions, ownable and possible, from well, the functions inside the ownable namespace and inside the possible namespace. You can, yeah. And there's a question there. Yeah. Uh, in, in the For example, if I want to import this one, do we need to create a higher version of this one? Or we can import the... The Soliti? No, no, you cannot import it right now in Soliti. Uh, we, this contract that I'm showing from Open Zeppelin are written in Cairo, are native in Cairo. I think there are plans to have more contracts from Open Zeppelin, right? Yes, Open Zeppelin is working to create the standard implementation. So any kind of contract you have on Solidity, you're used to have, uh, that is done by Open Zeppelin. We're working towards having that. Um, that being said, I mean, it takes time to develop contracts that are secure and everything. So um, if you want to develop them, you should. It's worth it. It's fun. And, you know, you may develop stuff that gets used by other people, which is great. Actually, Open Zeppelin, the contracts in Cairo by Open Zeppelin, they have a lot of contributions from people outside the community, so that would be great also. If somebody manages to write a Cairo contract that is the equivalent to the staking contract in synthetics, which is used by everyone, I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> More than a beer. <laughs> okay. It will eventually happen. It's very, if you, it's one of you. Okay. So we got our constructor, and then we can get to the part. Well, here we're using the initializer function inside the ownable namespace, and then we go to the getters. It's very simple. Functions, by definition, in Cairo are private, not like uh, Solidity. So here, if we want to have getters, functions to read information, we have to explicitly tell that they are getters. So, and something that I forgot to mention before, but this is the way, like very similar to how you do it in Python, how you define that this uh, has a particular set of properties, this function that, that is coming. In this case, with view, we're defining getter functions, functions where you can read from. So right now we're, we're creating this admin function that as you can see is exactly the same format as it comes in Open Zeppelin, for example, in ERC20 or ERC721, simply reading who the owner of the contract is. So for example, if I go again back to the contract, deploy contract here, I can read who the admin is. As you can see, this is a felt. But here I can convert it to hex. This is the owner of the contract, that is myself. Is this the same direction? So uh, talking about wallets, it's a good opportunity right now. Uh, you can use right now argentx, which is this one and also Bravos, that is this other one. Very recommended. You can use the Starnet faucet. You can simply put in Google Starnet faucet and you will be able to send yourself some fake eats so you can start making some interesting things using Early. Or more interestingly, you can also bridge your own eats from the girl testnet in, in the layer one into the layer two of Starnet. For example, here we're using Prime. I can, uh, I can ask for some fake eats, send it to my MetaMask, for example. And then using the bridge, 
I can connect my MetaMask, which is currently my, my wallet in layer one, and connect, for example, Arianex here as my wallet in layer two, and I can bridge these fake hits from Gerly layer one to layer two. So this is also very interesting. It's the same thing as asking for it in the faucet. So coming back to the contracts, <coughs> we have another gear function here. It's also a very typical open settling style function where you, where we are posing, we're asking, we're reading if this contract is currently post. Right? Very simple. And then more interestingly, here we have a view function to know the voting status is the one that I showed you before. It will let us know how many people voted yes, how many people voted no. As simple as that. Again, you can see in this function that we have an explicit argument and by now you are already asking yourself, what is this? What is this inside these keys? These are implicit arguments. This is uh, something that is different from other languages. You might not seen that before. But basically, uh, these repeat themselves all the time. Syscall pointer, percent pointer, and rate check pointer. We're interacting with the memory here. So we are talking that these are pointers actually to a felt and to a structure called hash building. No problem. No, we, we don't need to get that. That is something that we're repeating in each function. It doesn't matter. The real use is here. So we're asking here for an explicit argument that is the vote counting. Sorry, sorry. We're asking for nothing here. It's empty, the inputs. And the output is this. A status, a variable called status, that is the vote counting structure that we saw before. Again, Cairo is type, it's a type language. This helps for security. Any question until now for this function, for example? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Again, you can read it. You can read from the get voting status. This is the one that I was showing before. And currently the votes are yes or no. This is practically the structure we have and define here. This one, votes yes, votes no. It's exactly the same here. Okay, so, yeah, sure. Can I call another contract from using syscall from this contract? Using syscall. Yeah, it's like the address of another contract. Can I use it to call? You can call, of course, uh, these functions from another contract. That's, you can call them. And uh, we'll go to the external functions that also allow you to write. <laughs> Perfect, okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, you said that on line 99, you measure the input and output. What is on 96, 97, 98? Why, why are you not specifically Yes, that is what I was telling for, that is the implicit arguments. These are arguments that are passed without you explicitly telling these functions that you have passed them. So they, for example, when we are reading from the, from the storage, you have to provide these functions. The, the, sorry, the pencil pointer and the Cisco pointer, you have to provide them and they go into the read function. So in, inside here are the implicit function, implicit arguments. You don't see it because they are implicit. But yes, exactly. The, these implicit functions, if I take them off, they will have an error in the control. No problem. It's, it's not hard to, to, to get used to them. And also you can see each function that I'm adding here has them repeated. So no problem with that. Okay. Also, we have an overview function where we are getting the, the status of a voter. And yes, if you were simply reading into the voter info, a storage variable that we have before using the argument reads. So now going deeper into this, we can read and write from this storage function. In this case, we are reading. And as you remember, this storage function ask us for a user address that was precisely a felt. So if we provided a felt, then it will return us, let's see, what does it return? Yes, if we provided an address, it will return us a voter info structure, okay? So here I'm reading from it, and then we're returning it, simply as that. Status equals status, because the name of the variable here is status. And to see an example of how to write, 
This is exactly the same, the same storage variable that we saw before, voter info. We were able to read from it if we are inputting with the address. And we, knew, we now know that it returns an struct. Okay? So now we can write, using the argument write, we can write on it. So we're writing on the storage of our contract. And right now, this is basically an address. We will go deeper in a moment over it, but this is an address. And we're telling, telling it, for this address, please map this struct, okay? Very similar to how you look at it in solidity. Yes? Method dot sender is, uh, I think I have it here, get color address. With this, you're getting the address of the, of the contract that is calling this, this contract. So for example, in this case, this is the most important function, is the vote function. So what it does is simply, it's getting the address of the caller, it's storing it, and then we're reviewing the information of this person to see if this person has already bought or not, because we can only allow them if they have voted. And yes, in a moment we will go into that. When we talk about uh, MSG sender, um, if I'm not mistaken, MSG value uh, doesn't exist, right? Oh, could you repeat the question a little bit louder, please? How do you handle a variable? A variable? MSG uh, value, for example. Like an address, you mean? There's no notion of MSG.value in Starknet because there's no native currency. Everything's in ERC20. So there's no value attached to a call. There's no um, and there's no payable function. Did that answer your question? Okay. So. So yes. Um, mm -hmm. So let's go quickly into the most important function, the two most important functions, the register voters, and this will help me to uh, talk a, a little bit more about recursion that we use in Cairo. So again, as you can see, we have the implicit arguments as always. And then we are asking for two explicit arguments. The register address length, this, this is the, the, the length of an array. And the second value is the array itself. So first argument is the length of, the length of this array. The second argument is the, the array by itself. Then what we're doing here is, uh, and again, you can see all this contract in the repo I showed you before. It's in the start of the in case you are, uh, you want to follow it closer in your houses. And then what we're doing here is simply, and this is a, a, classi a classic function of Cairo that is using recursion. So right now we don't have force in Cairo, you have to use recursion. And this is a classic function for it. What we're reviewing here is that uh, this is the end of the recursion. So if we have already passed to every, each of these different members of the array, that is, if the length is zero, then we can return and the recursion is finished. Then here we're creating a small, a small uh, struct, the voter info. You remember we defined the struct called voter info. Here we are creating this votante info where we have this new voter info. So I'm, I'm saying here that allow is equal one. It could be zero, for example. So this function, what it's doing is that each of the address that I'm providing, it will register them as voters and will tell, will tell us that they are allowed to vote, okay? And then continuing a little bit with the recursion, what we're doing here is writing into storage, into the storage variable register voter. Yes. This one, we're mapping, as you remember before, we're mapping an address to a number. So this is an address. What we have here is this is the array, uh, very similar as you would do it in Python, for example, and other languages. You have the array and you can index through it using the square brackets, okay? So I am indexing in the, inside this array. For, this could be a number like one or two or five. Depends on the number of, of address that we are adding. And then we will say that the value for that address is one. We are simply mapping it here. And then we comes the, re the recursion part here. We are reading again the same function. 
and providing the length, but this is a lower length. As you can see, if we have, for example, five different voters, now we are providing it with four, okay? And we are sending it with the register address. And then it will repeat, it will repeat until it passes through each of the different addresses, and it is starting for, from the last one up to the first one. I know this looks a little bit crazy uh, using recursion, but uh, it's no problem. You, you can get used to it, and I'm thinking that uh, this will improve in the, in the near future, right? Yes. Oh, that's a good question. The question is that what happens if you get into an infinite recursion? Um, you okay? So there's there is the there's an answer for today and an answer for tomorrow. But basically, there's a form of gas metering in Starknet, just like in Ethereum. And if you reach a match, maximum number of steps, the sequencer will reject your transaction. Today, you're not you don't pay for these kind of transactions; they're just rejected. Tomorrow, um, you will be. It will be like a failed transaction on Ethereum. You will pay fees for the execution that led nowhere. Okay. Perfect. Any other questions for the moment? Okay. So simply, we have a recursion function here. Again, it's not that hard, and it will improve. We're talking that Cairo is a low-level language, and we have to be very honest and conscious about that. And finally, let's go to the last function, that is the voting function. This will allow us to call a function, as, as you can see here, it's an external function. External function simply means that we can write on the storage using it, okay? Not only read, but we can here write into the storage. Again, we have our implicit arguments. We have an explicit argument called vote. And here, don't mind this part, it's simply uh, telling the memory that we will be using, the compiler that we will be using local variables. No, we don't need to go through that. We're calling the possible function from, from open Zeppelin contracts, specifically the function called assert not post. It checks that if, if this contract is post or not. If it post, this person cannot vote, as simple as that. Then it gets the caller address. This was a, fun, uh, an, a question from before. With this function, we can get the address of this caller. We are storing it inside a caller function. Then we can read the information of this caller, of this address, using the read argument from this storage variable, storing it in info. And then we are simply reviewing if this person can vote or not. If they have allowed zero, then they cannot vote. Then we're creating a new voter, voter info struct that it says that this person has already voted because we don't want them to vote again. We are writing on the storage here. Everything here, we already know that. And finally, we are updating the status of the vote with the vote of this person. If, the, if this person voted yes or zero in this case, then it will update that with zero. The count with zero, and if they voted yes, in this case one, for example, then it will be updated, the, the count will be updated with a sum that we have here. And finally, we are updating the uh, final status of our, of our update, the, sorry, of our voting, and storing it into the storage. As you can see, this function is key, and if we go to the deploy contract, we go to the write contract, and then I can vote. In this case, this is the function. I don't remember what address I added, I think. So I will go to my Bravos, wallet in here, I was in my Argent before, and let's see if it allows me to vote. So I will vote with a one, and I will be able to sign this transaction because this address is registered to vote. I did when I deployed it, and right now what it, uh, this is the transaction hash, and we have to wait for a test to process this, and we will have our vote. Now, how can you deploy these contracts? You can deploy it using the command line tools by Starnet, or also, and my preferred way is to use Protostar. Protostar is a tool created in the image of Foundry. It's, it has the best practices from Foundry, and also some from Hardhat, sorry, from Truffle. So it's very interesting, it helps us to, to, to test, but also to deploy. 
So if I go right now to my command line, mm -hmm. this is how deploying this contract looks like. So basically, I'm, saying, I'm telling it protostar deploy this uh, contract that is already compiled by this moment. And what I want you to notice here is the part of the inputs. We talked before about the constructor accepting for, uh, three different inputs. First one is the owner, the admin of this voting. Second is the number of persons of registered addresses that can vote. And finally, the actual addresses. So this is how they look. This one, as you can see, is a hexa, a, a hexa value, and this is the address that is the owner of this contract. Then only one person or one address can vote, this one. And we can simply deploy it, run it like, like this. Protostar is very good, it's very usable, it has amazing testing functionalities, but you can also deploy your contracts. And that is simply the contract that we deploy here. And as we, as we can see, we already voted. If I go to read contracts, we should get a voting status where we had a vote with yes. With number one, it updated and zero is still no. I could not vote again because uh, theoretically, theoretically I should not be able to vote again. Let's see what happens. Oh, it should be, it, should, it shouldn't pass right now, but let's wait for it. So that will be the, the, the main part of the workshop. You, we have three minutes to more questions. Yes. The implicit? Yeah. Right now here, I don't have any, but they, they can change, depending on what you're building. Um, why do you have a scenario when they change? Mm. Can you think of a scenario when? When do implicit arguments change? Every time they're used, basically. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a deep question. The workshop is about to finish. If you want, let's meet outside, and we'll, we'll give you a, a, a more definitive answer. Yes. Mm, I think I have another message here. Uh, while I look for it, any other question in the meantime? I have a question for the audience. Before we wrap the, the workshop up, can we get, just get a quick show of hand? Who learned something during the workshop? Cool. Who thought this was too difficult? Who thought this was too easy? Okay, fine. <laughs> so it's great. This means this was spot on. Those of you who still are hungry, don't hesitate, ask us questions, come on our Discord, go on our resources, look at what we do. Uh, as, also, as Omar mentioned, like most of these things, the paradigm, you're used to that. You're used to how you write smart contracts, how you deal with scholars and stuff like that. The syntax is a bit different, the tooling is a bit different, but you can and will master Cairo. It's just a matter of just like trying. And this, will give, this tool will give you extreme power in your blockchain applications. So if you're looking to go more, to do more and go beyond what you can do with the EVM, I invite you like, do take a look. It really is powerful and will let you uh, build super cool stuff. And again, this is the QR to the educational resources. If you want to go look at them, we will have a booth on Thursday and Friday. You can ask any question, come with us. And finally, regarding the question, the, the error messages, this is how they look. So if this assertion, true or false, fails, then it will print this mistake, voter info. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Well, it depends on the, on the wallet. Uh, let's see, for example, this case, a certain allowance. Yeah, so what, your question is, what does an error message look like from the browser perspective? And essentially, you'll get a failed transaction like you do on Ethereum, and the trace, like the way it shows up, is kind of ugly, to be honest. It's still very rough around the edges. There's a lot of info that is not necessarily relevant to you, but the, message, the error message will appear somewhere, and you'll be able to know where the error is from. Like in general, this thing works, and this, scale, this thing scales Ethereum right now. It's a bit rough around the edges, meaning that it's not all pretty. There's a lot of info, or not enough, but uh, but it works. And it's cool. It's cool. This is how the error looks like. As you can see, that's the message that we saw before in the error. 
the explore info, your address is not allowed to vote. All right, we will have a booth. Please feel free to ask any questions, and thank you very much for coming.